Hello. Welcome to this short video about cognitive load theory from the MSc in Medical Education at the Swans University Medical School. What I hope you're able to do by the end of this short video is first to link the biology of working memory to the concept of cognitive load, and then to describe the application of cognitive load theory through a number of techniques. As always in these videos, we're going to be taking a pragmatic approach based on a model of pragmatic evidence-based education. In the model, we combine the most useful research evidence with your judgment as an educator about how, where, and when to apply that evidence and the context in which it's going to be applied. So we're going to be focusing on what's useful or not about cognitive load theory. The best place to start is to summarize the core principles of cognitive load theory. And we'll come back to these and expand upon them later in the video. First is that working memory is essential for learning. All of the sorts of things that we want students to learn in higher education or in health professions education have to pass through working memory. However, working memory has a very limited capacity. There's only a very small amount of information or knowledge that we can hold in there at any one time, and that knowledge doesn't stay there for very long. Cognitive load theory, then, is an approach to learning and teaching that prioritizes addressing these limitations in working memory. First of all, by not overloading working memory and using strategies to avoid overload. Secondly, deploying strategies that don't waste the limited capacity that working memory has. Let me give you some examples of the limitations of human working memory. Consider these 11 images. They're all of everyday objects that should be familiar to you. If I asked you to identify the book out of these 11 images, you'd be able to do it. Let's consider just one of them, the chicken. If I showed you a picture of a chicken alongside pictures of lots of other different types of bird, and I asked you to pick out which one of these is the chicken, you'd be able to do it. You'd be able to do the same for any one of these objects. If I showed you a whole different range of different types of fruit and asked you which one is the apple, you'd be able to do it. Those tasks are all very similar. Let me ask you to do something slightly different. If you were to look at these 11 images for five seconds or so, and then I showed you a blank slide, and I asked you to try and remember those 11 images for just 10 seconds, the chances are you wouldn't be able to do it. Here are some data from a study where we did exactly that. You can see here is the number of images that the participants were able to recall. And this is the percentage of participants that were able to recall that particular number of images. You can see that the most common was five or six images, and none of the participants were able to recall 10 or 11 images. Think about that for a second. It's quite a profound difference between those two tasks. I can show you a picture of a chicken alongside hundreds of different pictures of birds and ask you just to identify the chicken, you'd be able to do it. And yet when I show you these 11 common objects, you're able to name them all, but if I ask you to remember them for just five or 10 seconds, the chances are you wouldn't be able to do it. Most people aren't able to do it. That's because you're using a different type of memory in those two different tasks. There are three main types of memory you need to be aware of when we're considering cognitive load theory. The first is short-term memory, otherwise known as sensory processing. You're processing a huge amount of information at any one time. Most of it you're not even conscious of. When you pay attention to a particular piece of information, it goes into your working memory. Once you learn that piece of information, then it goes into your long-term memory. The transition between these two then, attention is what drives information from short-term memory into working memory, and learning gets information from working memory into long-term memory. It's a very simplistic explanation of the different types of memory, but it's enough to help us understand cognitive load theory. The most important part of our explanation is the difference in capacity between these different types of memory. Working memory has a tiny capacity compared to the huge capacity that long-term memory has. We're only able to store approximately four to seven chunks of information in working memory at any one time. So when I ask you to try and hold on to those 11 images, you're not able to do it. However, when I ask you to pick out a familiar image from a range of similar images, you are able to do it because you're using a different type of memory. You're using your long-term memory. You're reaching into it and picking out the familiar information. Cognitive load theory, then, is an approach to learning and teaching that prioritizes this bottleneck, prioritizes strategies which get around the problems, the limitations of human working memory by not overloading it. There are three main types of load or cognitive load that we need to think about when we're thinking about cognitive load theory. The first is intrinsic cognitive load. Very simplistically, this is a measure of how difficult a piece of learning is. 
If I ask you to learn the calculation 2 times 2, that's a lot easier than 741 times 627, for example. Some subjects are just harder than others. Germane cognitive load is the amount of work that working memory is doing that is dedicated to the desired learning. Extraneous cognitive load, which is perhaps the most important type of cognitive load from an instructor's perspective, is any work that working memory is doing that is irrelevant or distracting. According to cognitive load theory then, good instructional design does three things. It maximizes germane load. It makes it easy for learners to focus on the things that we want them to focus on. It minimizes extraneous load. It strips out as many sources of distraction as possible. Many of those sources of distraction are things that learners don't have an awful lot of control over, as we'll see. Most importantly, perhaps, cognitive load theory prioritizes strategies that avoid overloading working memory. We'll come on to some of those in a second, but I'm going to talk now a little bit about sources of extraneous cognitive load. A lot of these are very common and things that you'll find in everyday teaching materials. A lot of these come under the heading seductive details. These are interesting but irrelevant adjuncts to teaching. Little decorative trinkets and baubles that we might put on some teaching materials to try and make them more engaging but are actually just distracting and can act as a source of extraneous cognitive load. They measurably impair learning and they can come in many different forms and I'm going to show you just a couple of them. Brace yourself, here is a very common source of extraneous cognitive load that we might also call a seductive detail. We like to put decorative animated images on our slides to make them more engaging. I'll stop that right now so that you're paying attention to the things that I want you to pay attention to. Anything that's decorative and isn't related to the desired learning can act as a seductive detail, it can draw your attention away from the things that we want you to focus on and can act as a source of extraneous cognitive load. We have to balance seductive details with other aspects of instructional design that are designed to make learning meaningful and engaging. And in particular, there's very good evidence, as we'll see in a separate video, that we can use concrete examples to make abstract ideas meaningful and engaging for learners. Let's say you're using a famous person as an example of an abstract idea or of a particular concept. You have to make sure that the famous person is famous for the reasons that you want them to be famous and isn't famous for a whole load of other reasons. Let's say you use a famous politician or a famous pop star. If you use them as an example of some abstract idea, your learners are going to be focused on all the other reasons why that person is famous. Let's say they agree or disagree with their political views, or they like or dislike their music or their films. That's going to be a seductive detail that's going to draw people's attention away from the thing that you want to focus on. Now it might seem like a very small and trivial fact to draw people's attention away temporarily from the desired learning. But anything that does, takes people's attention away from the desired learning is going to take up space in working memory. And as we've seen, there isn't a lot of space in working memory to be distracted in. There isn't a lot of space in working memory that we can occupy with things that aren't relevant. Here are some more examples of seductive details. Visually appealing and engaging but distracting backgrounds on slides and other instructional materials. Multicolored fonts or fonts that clash or don't match with the background. It's very difficult for me to talk about seductive details on a slide that has a lot of seductive details. So I'm going to skip swiftly on to the next slide and talk a bit more about what happened on the previous one. Many of us are afraid of a plain, simple background with plain, simple text. But when we put up an engaging or visually appealing background, there's the risk that it engages and distracts the learner from what we actually want them to be engaged with. The same with multicolored fonts or fonts that clash. All of these things act as seductive details because they draw attention away from what we want people to be focused on. It may seem like a trivial distraction or it may seem like they won't distract people for very long, but working memory doesn't have a lot of room in it to occupy these distracting materials and it doesn't occupy information for very long either. So anything we can do to take these distractions and extraneous cognitive load sources away is a good thing. Now we're going to move from talking about extraneous load into overload in general. The research into cognitive load theory has come up with a whole range of different approaches to teaching and to learning. There are some common principles that underlie these approaches and I'm going to talk through those and then use a couple of examples to illustrate the point. One of the key principles that underlies a lot of these approaches is the provision of some sort of scaffolding. 
What learners are trying to do in cognitive load theory is to get from their state of current knowledge to a state of future knowledge, a state of current ability in terms of skills to a future ability in terms of skills. If we do that in all in one big step, same as if we try to construct a building without scaffolding, then we're going to fail. If our learners have to hold too much information in their mind at any one time, then they're going to become overloaded. What cognitive load theory does through a variety of different approaches is it breaks learning down into shorter steps. This way then learners don't become overloaded and they're able to learn effectively without becoming overloaded. Let me give you one example. It's the so-called problem completion effect. Let's say we have some novice learners on a health professions education course. What we want them to be able to do by the end of the course is to write a treatment plan for a particular set of patients. If the learners are novice learners and they don't know anything about the treatments that they're going to prescribe and the side effects of them and what the interactions with other drugs are, then they're going to become overloaded. By applying the problem completion effect, we break learning down into a series of steps. So rather than starting by asking them to write a treatment plan, we might ask them to critique part of a plan. We then might ask them to critique an entire plan. Then we might ask them to write part of the plan themselves and eventually we get them to the point where they write an entire plan. There's a related effect to this called the worked examples effect, where you give learners a worked example of where you want them to get to. This provides a mental scaffolding that again helps avoid them becoming overloaded. A couple of other important principles from cognitive load theory rely on this principle of contiguity. Spatial contiguity and temporal contiguity, keeping related pieces of information together and avoid them having to be held in working memory. Again, let me give you an example. Let's say I'm trying to teach you about the lobes of the brain. And here's an illustrated diagram of the major lobes of the brain with a couple of other brain regions labeled as well. Here, the names of the regions of the brain are spatially contiguous, i.e. they're adjacent to, they're next to the regions that they're labeling. It's a very common approach in lots of different teaching materials and textbooks to label them something like this instead. Here now, the relevant pieces of information and the labels are spatially discontiguous. They're separated. Although this might seem like a trivial distinction, when the learner is looking from the label for the frontal lobe to the frontal lobe picture itself, they have to hold that information in their working memory. That's not necessary if we use information that is an approach to this teaching that is spatially contiguous. Temporal contiguity applies the same principle, but it involves keeping related pieces of information together in time rather than just in space. The final effect I want to talk about from cognitive load theory is what we call the expertise reversal effect. If we stick with our analogy of scaffolding, as a building nears completion, we need to start taking the scaffolding down. Otherwise, it's going to get in the way. The same is true of learning. If we use problem completion as an example, as our learners move from novice to expert and they start being able to write their own treatment plans, if we keep asking them to critique part of a plan that we did at the beginning of their learning, then that's going to get in the way and might actually impair learning. There's also some evidence that experts do less well on some of these early stage tasks in learning than novices. Finally, then, we want to consider, as part of our model of pragmatic evidence-based education, whether or not cognitive load theory is useful. What is the most useful research evidence out there? Is it itself a useful approach to learning and teaching? Now, there are some criticisms of cognitive load theory, and I'm going to run through a couple of the most prominent. Cognitive load theory is derived from a whole series of experiments in cognitive psychology. And there's some concern about whether the findings can translate from experimental or laboratory control conditions into the more naturalized world of a classroom or a lecture theater or a clinical skills teaching lab. There is some evidence that it can, and lots of the findings have been replicated in more naturalized settings, but there's still a lot of work to do. The second major consideration about cognitive load theory is that it's very much focused on what happens up here and doesn't really pay an awful lot of attention to what happens in the environment and to factors that are outside of the immediate teaching environment as well. If students are stressed or they've got problems at home or when they're studying at home they turn on the TV or they're hungry, then cognitive load theory doesn't have an awful lot to say about that. It doesn't also have, also have a lot to say about the learning environment. The learning environment is very important for determining how successful learning is. And cognitive load theory, because of its focus on what's happening in here, hasn't yet fully branched out into considerations of the learning and teaching environment. Again, it's probably just more work that needs to be done before we get there. 
Overall, then, is cognitive load theory useful? My personal perspective is that yes, it is, in part because it's very practical. You can pick up a simple guide to cognitive load theory or one of the review papers that's cited at the end of this video, and very quickly you can pick up some practical tips and tricks that will probably improve things for your students and for you as well. Summary then, let's just go back over the core principles of cognitive load theory. Working memory is essential for learning. All of the things that we want students in higher education and health professions education, all of the things we want them to learn are going to have to go through working memory in some form, and yet working memory has a very limited capacity. It can only hold a very small amount of information for a very limited period of time. Cognitive load theory then says very simply, don't overload working memory and don't waste the capacity that it has. Here are some of the references that we've used here. If you put, do a simple Google Scholar or Eric search for cognitive load theory, you're going to come up with a whole series of review articles that might be useful. My advice would be to stick, by, stick to the articles written by John Sweller, who's one of the founders of cognitive load theory, and has worked with a great number of people over a great number of years to turn this experimental psychology into something that's useful for learning and teaching. That's it from me. I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.